uh, as Antonio said, my plan for today is um, to mm, kind of think for a moment about uh, the kinds of predictions or various kinds of predictions uh, that are being made and tested in the context of gravitational wave uh, astronomy, hence uh, the LIGO in the title. And because um, this, uh, um, this is a talk that is kind of concerned with philosophical foundations of general relativity, then if we talk about predictions made in gravitational wave astronomy or something like that, if you have read some bits of the great classic literature uh, going back to the late 70s, then you may think, oh, but haven't those people shown that prediction in general relativity is basically impossible or at least highly limited? Um, so what kind of prediction are we talking about uh, in the context of gravitational wave astronomy? This is the sort of intellectual setup uh, for this talk. And um, yes, accordingly, my aim for today is to discuss an example of a successful test of a general relativistic prediction in the context of those theorems which aim to establish that the possibility of making successful predictions in GR is highly limited. And I think it's a, um, I don't think one could make something like strong skeptical claims about LIGO predictions. Don't get me wrong, I'm not going to suggest anything like that. Rather, I'm going to use the example of a LIGO setup to make some observations about different senses of predictions uh, um, that are, we are kind of making uh, in the context of GR. Uh, so my goal is not skeptical. I'm not going to say that you know, LIGO was not a successful prediction or anything like that. I think it was an extremely successful prediction. But interestingly, it's a slightly different kind of prediction than the prediction considered in the context of the no-go theorems concerning predictions in general relativity. Okay, this is the upshot, and I shouldn't give too many spoilers. Uh, I would rather say this is the structure of the stock. Uh, so I will take you through some trivial platitudes and use that to kind of generate a puzzle um, um, or elaborate on the puzzle because in a way I've already introduced the puzzle. Um, and then um, I will take us through some of the statements of the no-go theorems concerning predictions in GR. Um, then I will make the observation that there seem to be at least two types of predictions, one of which is covered by those no-go theorems, but the other does not seem to be. Um, and then I will situate some of the things I uh, want to say about this setup in the context of what other people in the literature have said about the no-go results. And finish with some uh, concluding remarks. Uh, for what else one could think of uh, in this context. Okay, so yeah, this is the plan. Um, so let's hit the platitudes part. Um, so here's what I think can be rightfully called a platitude, namely that a physical theory, in particular general relativity, is successfully, please ignore the spelling mistake, used to make predictions. Um, I think, and I hope it's a rather uncontroversial statement. Um, similarly to this second statement that, well, our world seems to be like a GR spacetime. And so we should think of ourselves as observers living in a relativistic spacetime. And so if there are some substantial limitations of, of epistemic powers of observers living in the relativistic space times, we should also think of ourselves as subject to similar um, epistemic limitations and constraints. Um, now, uh, there are some formal, rather abstract, but provable statements concerning limitations on a, a, of at least some kinds of predictions. Uh, so the theorems which allegedly, or according to the kind of 
commonly seen interpretation in the literature imply that prediction in general relativity is very limited. And so if you take all of those three things together, then you may say, okay, the world is our world is some kind of a GR space-time. We're observer living in, within that space-time, but our epistemic access to what happens around us seems to be highly limited on the basis of those theorems. At least if the sense of prediction captured in uh, those formal results is the only kind of prediction that, uh, or the most significant kind of prediction uh, that is available to us. And um, I want to make this a bit sharper and this is where the LIGO example comes in, because I think it's simply because I think it's an interesting case study that has not been, uh, um, at least as far as I'm aware, explicitly considered in the context of those um, epistemic limitations and that we are actually or allegedly uh, faced with in GR space times. So um, I want to now present the puzzle and kind of sharpen uh, 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 some of the conflicting feelings you may have about those platitudes and formal results. Um, so I think it's very natural to say things like, by detecting gravitational waves, the LIGO collaboration successfully tested one of the key predictions of general relativity and confirmed the theory. Um, and now, prima facie, at least with, with the kind of background of those uh, theorems concerning limitations of predictions on the back of your mind, you may think that this is confusing because you may think that, well, somehow we have to face up a choice between a Nobel Prize winning experiment that costed up to 2015 only 1.1 US dollars billion worth of money and has been carried over 40 plus years by a number of extremely brilliant physicists and a true mathematical statement. And I think it's a hard bet. Uh, um, so what to do? Maybe LIGO did not text, test the prediction or maybe they were just lucky. Like what, or maybe they were just operating under entirely different notion of prediction. Like what's going on here? Um, and uh, I will, throughout the section two and kind of three of this talk, I will be trying to kind of most confuse you further about the situation and only then I will start clearing up. But a little spoiler is that, well, it will turn out that part of the prediction which was successfully tested by LIGO is quite different from the sense of prediction considered in those no-go theorems. And that some of the other predictions tested by LIGO are not affected uh, by those theorems because um, um, they verge on the retrodiction in the sense consistent with those theorems. But what I think is most philosophically interesting upshot of this is that actually some important part of the prediction tested by LIGO is very different from the sense of prediction uh, considered so far in the literature. At least also uh, I claim and so I will uh, hope to convince you. Um, okay, and just so we're all on the same page, I think I should give you a quick or rather two quick primer on the LIGO, Virgo, Carga, Kagra observations of gravitational waves. Um, so what happens in those observations is uh, you have uh, a network of interferometers, uh, uh, two networks, two, two, sorry, uh, two interferometers uh, in, uh, the case of the original LIGO uh, setup and then further extended with an Italian component and a Japanese component. So that, that's the Virgo and Kagra. Um, um, and the goal is that uh, as the gravitational wave uh, generated by certain astrophysical events passes through those perpendicular interferometer arms, it generates a strain and you want to measure the strain. And from that, you kind of want to see what the shape of a gravitational wave uh, passing through uh, is like. And the first detection uh, happened on the 15th of September of 2014. And since then, in three observational runs, this collaboration made approximately 90 uh, confirmed detections and have, has um, extensive plans uh, uh, for further development of uh, um, the sensitivity of those observatories. Um, and what I think will be 
important for us at some point later on is that uh, LIGO operates with a kind of different pipelines, uh, different search pipelines, so to speak. And there are unmodeled searches where basically we look uh, at whether the strain crosses a certain threshold and then consider that to be a gravitational wave event. But most of the uh, kind of pipelines that actually gave us most of those 90 detections are proceed through our different implementations of the matched filtering method. So basically what happens in the matched filtering method is that you have um, a large catalog of waveform templates that have been computed for what we think are physically plausible uh, sources of gravitational waves, uh, which are strong enough to be detected or to be registered by those detectors. Um, and those templates are matched onto the strain data um, in real time. Um, right. And of course, the LIGO Virgo Cagra is not the last word uh, in uh, here. So people also consider uh, other designs uh, um, of a detector. So for instance, Einstein telescope would be a triangular uh, detector rather than uh, two uh, separate uh, L-shaped interferometers. Uh, there's the idea of a so-called cosmic explorer observatory, which would be where the arms of the interferometer would be much longer and also for an orbiting uh, space uh, antenna and uh, um, European Space Agency authorized the LISA Pathfinder mission to kind of test the possibility um, of that scenario. And so gravitational wave astrophysics uh, seems to have uh, rather great prospects um, ahead of it. And accordingly, there's also some recent philosophy work on LIGO by among others, uh, Lydia Patton uh, and uh, Jamie Elder, um, um, as well as some earlier work by, uh, for instance, Alan Franklin. Um, um, and of course, there's also amazing historical work on these topics by people like uh, Dan Kenefik, uh, for instance. So it's a, uh, it's uh, over and above uh, the claims about predictions I'm going to make. Uh, this is uh, something of high uh, philosophical interest, I think. And just so we're, uh, I guess, almost every second talk on the LIGO has to show this kind of a picture. So this is the picture of the 1509-14 uh, gravitational wave event. And so um, what we see here are the strain data uh, at two detectors matched onto the uh, predicted numer numerical relativity uh, templates. and this sort of a gravitational wave uh, signal um, kind of corresponds to uh, somewhere here, uh, lay the, um, kind of the situation where the sources we are looking at are getting close and close to each other, uh, then so the um, um, different terms are used, but let me call them the early in spiral phase, um, then the phase where they're uh, the, if they're black holes, then their event horizons are almost touching with each other um, and merge uh, together. So the merger phase and then the ring down where the system uh, um, kind of dissipates to the stationary stage. Um, mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think this is all that I, well, I would like to say many more things about LIGO, but we only have time uh, for this much. I hope uh, we're now kind of on the same page about some of the aspects of how uh, these observations actually do work. And uh, I can now take you through uh, some of the things that have been said about prediction. Um, in the literature. Um, so I should first say that claims about impossibility of prediction have a long tradition. So my exposition here will follow uh, J.B. Manchak's uh, 2008 uh, paper on this topic, but Manchak is neither first nor the only one to make similar points. Um, uh, they're just 
been made most recently, I think, and most clearly. Um, um, and it kind of presented us skeptical uh, points about uh, kind of our epistemic capabilities. Um, but there is a number of other offers, um, certainly Bob Garrosh in 77, um, and Hog people like uh, Hogarth and Ehrman uh, in the 90s. And there is, uh, I should, if, if you know, if you're familiar with this literature, you know that there is a, a extremely closely, but still somewhat distinct issue of the underdetermination of the global structure of space-time. Um, so, um, the possibility of prediction concerns about whether, given our epistemic situation here and now, we could say something about what the situation will be like at some other space-time point. And this is what I consider myself to be interested with in this talk. But you may also ask, given kind of epistemic situations observers, what statements could they truthfully, or, or what kind of statements could be made about the global structure of space time we find ourselves in, as opposed to what happens at a particular space time point. And this uh, line of inquiry takes you closer to the underdetermination of the global structure of space time or um, and related issues. And those issues, those two things, prediction made about what happens at a particular space time point and prediction about, or sorry, and I should, I take that back, it's not, uh, and statements about um, the global structure of space-time are closely related because in um, kind of providing formal justifications for various statements made down in this context, the kind of proof method is very similar, used is very similar because in both of those cases, one takes a space-time point um, where the observer is located and kind of cleverly folds it and cuts and pastes um, uh, that space-time in order to um, uh, make formally sound statements. And so in the sense, those questions are closely related, but I, at least I find them to be somewhat distinct because one of them concerns what happens at a particular point and the other concerns global features of a space-time observer finds uh, themselves to be immersed in it. Um, and so um, for a number of reasons, I'm just going to be concerned with uh, predictions made about what happens at particular space-time points. And I'm going to ignore underdetermination of the global structure of space-times, um, either using, uh, so either claims about that made with the help of the so-called, what some people call the cut and paste construction or the close line construction. Uh, but these claims could also be made uh, in the context of spatial topology and cosmological models using uh, kind of more friendly to computer, contemporary mathematical relativity techniques based on partial differential equations. Um, uh, and there is an excellent discussion of uh, some of these issues um, in, for instance, uh, John Norton's work on, in uh, Jeremy's uh, work on undetermination in cosmology. Um, and if you're talking about this, I should also say that many interesting things could be said, although not all of the things that kind of like could be said uh, should be endorsed. Uh, 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 but many interesting things could be said about extension of these underdetermination claims, which have been kind of traditionally looked at in cosmological models, in the context of cosmological models, to black hole space times. And this is a subject of, I think, quite fun ongoing work by me and Eric Curiel. I'm happy to talk about this uh, in the Q&A, uh, but I'm going to ignore uh, black holes, uh, at least isolate the black holes uh, in what follows. Um, the upshot of all of this is that uh, prediction and determination are closely related, but they're not quite the same. And that claims about impossibility of prediction in GR have quite a long uh, philosophical tradition uh, in a way. Um, so I now want you to take you through a simple notion of prediction and more advanced notion of predictions. And at the end of it, I will state theorems uh, proven by Manchak, which I think are the most up-to-date uh, 
known uh, formal results underlying claims concerning limitations of limitation on predictive power of observers. Um, so the theorems, because if we want to prove a theorem, then we should have some formal explication of what the prediction is. And the idea is that, well, okay, we start with some point Q in spacetime and we characterize what's the domain of prediction of that point. And um, two simple kind of um, um, requirements might be that the set of points P, which it, that the domain of prediction consists of set of points P, which are not in the causal past of the point Q. Um, and moreover, there is an achromal closed space-like surface in the causal past of Q such that the point P is in the domain of dependence um, of that surface S. So why those two requirements? Well, uh, Matrix explication, I think, is wonderful. So let me just invoke it. Um, the first condition requires that whatever else is the case, any knowledge concerning the state of a first at P is a prediction and not a retrodiction. Um, so um, this is why uh, domain of points in the domain of prediction should not uh, be placed uh, to the past of me making a prediction here and now. And the second condition requires that every causal influence that could affect uh, the point P must have been registered on some um, uh, space like slice. And so we can, the way we can think of this is, um, I want to know what happens uh, at P. Uh, and so I'm setting up um, some kind of a network of, uh, you know, monitoring devices uh, that look at what happens on the space like slice S and they register everything that happens through that. And I kind of uh, um, armed with the information about what happens at S, I can then make predictions uh, uh, about what happens at P. So there are kind of like no confounding factors coming in from infinity, no unregistered sources of signals um, that I have no idea of and so on. Um, okay, so this is the kind of like a simple or basic uh, notion of prediction. And then uh, one could uh, introduce two further kind of conditions about uh, prediction. So one could consider kind of like two um, modifications of this uh, notion of a domain of prediction. So one can only be concerned with, one can be concerned with it directly verifiable domain of prediction. And so this is domain of prediction of some point, which is intersected with the chronological future of that point. Uh, and it makes sense to think about directly verifiable domain of prediction, um, because what this tells us is that uh, kind of uh, the prediction, the points about which we make predictions are localized to our future. And so we kind of like, we can go there and test whether our prediction is actually true. But, uh, um, and so like, if you think, for instance, if you were in like a very quickly expanding cosmological situation, I am here and now I make prediction about what happens here. But, you know, if the expansion takes the point about which I made a prediction kind of here and takes me away from that and we end up being space, uh, like kind of like space like separated, then I have no means to verify my prediction. Um, and so then uh, in that case, uh, that point would fall outside of a directly verifiable domain of prediction uh, from my point of view. And so it's not great because I cannot go and check whether my prediction about this was true. Um, and then uh, mm, there's a second notion, the domain of genuine prediction. And that notion requires that an observer has a resources about to make a prediction and moreover resources to know that we can make a prediction. And this uh, is captured the idea that um, the causal past of a point uh, uh, about which we make a prediction is invariant under uh, kind of like possible permutations of the situation. So it doesn't change. The causal past of that point doesn't change if we move from one space time uh, to another. And the idea is that this captures uh, uh, the way in which we do know that we make, uh, do actually make a prediction. Okay, and so 
armed with those notions, uh, um, we can do a little warm up exercise. Uh, and so we can think about what happens in Minkowski space time. So it's Minkowski space time is causal well behaved. So we can fix the data on something like t equal constant slice or any other um, um, well behaved slice. And we do know that those data do uniquely determine past and future um, in that space time. Mm. But if we think of ourselves as observers located within Minkowski space time, we cannot use this data to make predictions about the whole space time because there is no point P such that this whole slice would be contained in the observer's causal past. So we only have like partial access um, um, uh, to this uh, slice. And so we can see here that kind of like the notion of prediction and the notion of determinism or global determinism in a way start to diverge. Um, and but in Minkowski space time, you could say in a sense that even local prediction is not possible, only retrodiction is, because if for any point P and any space like surface S, if the whole of S is in the causal past of P, then so must be the domain of dependence of S. And we only wanted to make predictions about what happens in the domain of dependence um, of such uh, sets. But note that if the spatial slices were compact and the metric was like Minkowski, so now we take uh, Minkowski space time, which is uh, you know uh, spatially open, and we compactify it uh, uh, along the space light axis, then the prediction about the whole space time would be possible uh, because t equals constant slice uh, might actually be uh, entirely contained uh, in my causal path, and so then this kind of like move from spatially open system to spatially closed system would be beneficial for my predictive powers because I could predict whereas I couldn't have predicted before, so to speak. Um, and so um, that kind of gives you intuitions that, well, um, close, being spatially closed is helpful for prediction uh, and uh, being open is kind of bad for prediction. And Manchak has been able to prove the following two results, that if the directly verifiable domain of prediction is non-empty, then the space time must be spatially closed. And that the domain of genuine prediction of a point is contained in the boundary of the causal past of that point. And so the first one, um, I think, it's maybe not as surprising, but the second one is really worrisome. Uh, because um, one could, and I think it's a natural interpretation of those theorems that the only possible predictions, uh, at least if we're in the open situation, are those which are on the verge of being retrodictions. And uh, one could then draw a further philosophical conclusion that if the epistemological predicament of the observer is fully considered, then there seems to be an interesting and robust sense in which some form of prediction is not possible in general relativity. Um, and of course, we can start like make, bringing up worries about this. Maybe is the epistemic predicament of the observer fully considered here, for instance? Um, but um, and a number of others, and I will address some of these in what follows. But uh, um, at least insofar as we can think of prediction as something that uh, kind of includes those desiderata, uh, those formal desiderata used by Manchak, then indeed it seems to be the case that prediction is, uh, well, maybe not really, it's not possible, but it's extremely limited. Mm. And so by the platitudes that I have considered at first, also our epistemic situation is, uh, extremely limited because we seem to have no evidence that anything uh, that the universe uh, we're living in uh, is uh, spatially closed. And at least if it is, then we do not have yet uh, access uh, to uh, uh, the closed slice. And so then our epistemic situation is uh, pretty bad because our only possible predictions, which are those which are on the verge of being retrodictions. Or so one could interpret uh, those two theorems. 
Um, but now let's go back to the LIGO example, right? So now we can, we can start to get worried. If those theorems are true and our world is like some GR space time, then what sense GR can give us correct predictions about gravitational waves? Is there some other sense of prediction operating here? Or maybe LIGO does not operate on the basis of prediction at all, but why would we spend one billion, over $1 billion on a non-prediction? That would be bad, like we don't want that. <laughs> or maybe it's merely luck that the LIGO succeeded in testing the prediction. Uh, that's also kind of, I would find that to be also kind of problematic. Um, it, I, I think it seems natural and reasonable to claim that there is a bit more to LIGO than you know, some kind of like accidental kind of predictions. But if those no go theorems about predictions are true, how could there be more to the LIGO prediction or to some of the predictions that says about LIGO? I think that's at least this, this is of course a highly kind of confusing situation of someone who's confused and worried. I hope that I managed to introduce at least some of you to this confused and worried state, but don't worry, I'm going to start to clear this up and uh, we will be less worried and less confused, I hope, by the end of this talk. And if you're not uh, confused and or worried, then this is good for you. Perhaps you can see a few steps ahead about what I'm going to say. Um, or at least find it, or maybe you see a different reason why we shouldn't be worried and confused. And that's also interesting because so far apart from um, um, cosmological cases, which have been kind of explicitly discussed, these more local notions of predictions haven't really been contrasted with um, particular examples. And I think it's good to contrast those abstract philosophical claims with particular examples. Um, okay, so now I think part of the philosophical clearing up of all of this is that as a matter of fact, there are at least two types of predictions um, that operate in the gravitational wave astronomy. Um, and I'm going to take you through what might be your yet another natural reaction to this kind of puzzle that I'm presented. You may be thinking something along the following lines. Yulish, please stop being so dramatic about this. This is, this is not a genuine drama. You're creating this drama. Because after all, those notions, those theorems about predictions use just one notion of prediction. Perhaps there are other notions of predictions or other ways in which you use GR to make predictions and we could perhaps point to these um, other notions of predictions. And there may be no incompatibility between these other notions of predictions and all those platitudes and all those theorems. And so in that way, um, we could kind of um, dissolve uh, this whole situation situation, so to speak. And I think that if that's your intuition, then I think this is the right one. I think a correct way out of the puzzle I tried to get us into is uh, that actually many predictions we are using in GR, we, we are making using GR are not predictions in the sense of that formal explication used uh, um, by um, the great philosophers uh, of, uh, uh, of the past and of the more recent past. And I think in particular that some important aspects of the prediction test that uh, with like or not predictions on the basis of initial data contained in the past of the detector, in that sense, there is no uh, conflict between the, all these platitudes and LIGO and or kind of like the commonsensical interpretation of LIGO and those theorems after all. It's just that a particular way of thinking about making predictions which is captured in those formal requirements is maybe not the most fortunate choice for describing some of the important aspects of the predictions made uh, in gravitational wave astronomy. Okay, this is where I want to get us into how to get there. Well, I think there are at least kind of like two types of predictions. I'm kind of still hesitating about giving them um, like fully definite names, but the first type of prediction may be something like a prediction about a particular system. And so in other words, this could be something like prediction, which is a claim about what the development of known initial data, data over time will be looking like after some time elapsed. Uh, 
And so this, this kind of like type one of prediction assumes that as an observer, I do know initial data contained to my past, let's say, um, and I'm, I'm something like mass, spin, and relative positions of two neutron stars. I'm going to be using neutron stars examples because they do not have horizons. And so they're kind of like easier to think of uh, as something that is contained to my past than uh, a black hole. Um, but I think one could equally well uh, to kind of tell the story using some quasi-local characterization of a black hole. But for neutron stars, uh, it being contained to my past is less problematic. And so in this kind of a prediction about a particular system, I would make claims about dynamical evolution of that system. Uh, and it seems to me that the no-go theorems are kind of targeting this kind of a prediction. Um, and if this is how the prediction tested by LIGO would look like, then I think the no-go results would be applicable and we would have to uh, um, give some story about, wait, maybe this is actually a retrodiction, maybe this is not a genuine prediction, maybe it's on the verge of being a retrodiction or um, some other um, story like that. And I will consider examples of uh, an answer like that when I will be discussing Casey McCoy's reply to Manchak's examples um, in just a moment. But I think an important part of the LIGO, of a prediction tested by LIGO is not a prediction about the future dynamics of a particular system. Rather, it's a claim about occurrence and behavior of a system of a certain kind. It's rather a statement about kind of like our cosmic environment, uh, so to speak. And it doesn't seem to be a prediction about the particular system. So let's think about, you know, uh, the epistemic situation of uh, gravitational wave astronomy in the 70s. Uh, so we want to detect gravitational waves. Uh, it's a, of course, a robust prediction of the theory. Um, so we're saying, okay, let's build an observatory that will be able to do that. Um, what kind of prediction will we test with that observatory? We will not test the prediction of the form. These two neutron stars will merge in a particular way and then provide us with uh, um, a particular gravitational wave signal that we uh, can detect. Rather, it takes something like the following form. Sometimes, and the rate of the occurrence of those uh, um, detections, um, within a certain frequency range, a signal with some specific signature hopefully consisted with one of the templates from a very large catalog of numerically gravitated templates will be registered at the detector by altering uh, the length of the arms of the interferometer and thus uh, by generating the appropriate kind of measurable strain. Mm. But so what is being tested is a hypothesis about existence of a certain kind of a systems which are like gravitationally bound and with large enough masses so that the signal we get is in the right frequency range. Um, but the location of those systems, how many of them there are and what states they're in is not assumed to be known. These kinds of informations, which under the first way of making prediction of a particular sense is what you would think you have access to and make prediction on the basis of, uh, this kind of information is rather extracted from the registered signal. And so this sort of like prediction about what our environment is like seems to be quite different from the prediction about what the future fate of a particular system uh, will look like. And it seems to me that those formal theorems really target the first kind of prediction, but not the second kind of a prediction. Um, however, this is not to say that something like solutions to the initial value problem, which what you may think is like crucial for the first kind of prediction, uh, so the solutions to the initial value problem are not useless in making the second kind of a prediction because after all LIGO uses a database of approximately quarter uh, million of uh, templates so the waveform shapes of gravitational waves expected to be generated in um, different 
kinds of merger events, including, you know, extreme uh, mass differences, small mass differences, black hole, black hole collisions, neutron star, neutron star mergers, mixed mergers, um, and so on. Uh, and so, you know, as a matter of fact, these uh, templates are crucial for the success of the matched filtering search. And most of the LIGO detections come from the matched filtering search. Um, and so in the sense, solutions to the initial value problems are still among the key components of the detection. But these tests do not assume that the location of the source of, this, uh, of the signal is known. And so again, although we use initial value problems in making uh, like a prediction, we do not make those predictions on the particular of, on the basis of, you know, causally registered information about state of a signal um, at a time. And if you're worried that those are uh, all constructed on the basis of GR, you right to be worried. Have a look at some of Jamie Elder's work, but there's also recent progress in modified gravity-based uh, templates for LIGO. Uh, I think it's uh, cool enough that it deserves uh, uh, a mention here. Um, and uh, well, the properties of colliding objects are, as a matter of fact, inferred from the measured signal. So again, if you thought that LIGO operates under a certain kind of prediction, um, you would run into the difficulty because, uh, you know, whether the objects are black hole stars or neutron stars, what are their masses, spins, what is an approximate location of the source, none of those are kind of like known in advance uh, of the detection. They're deduced from the signal that we uh, register. Uh, in the observatory. As a matter of fact, for most of the LIGO detections, we do not even know what is the approximate, we don't even know the exact location of the source. Uh, um, uh, and uh, most of them have not been kind of even tested with, have not, have, uh, be because of that, most of those observations have not been tested using follow-up measurements in the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. I'm not sure about RAN03, but out of the 11 detections in one in runs one and two, only the neutron star neutron star uh, merger had electromagnetic follow up uh, that has been observed. Um, and so um, all of those, all of this information that is kind of like crucial for making the first kind of prediction is not that something that is being known uh, in LIGO, it's kind of rather deduced from the registered signal. Um, and I think one could also make a claim that the detection rate is also not a predictable quantity because rather it's the frequency of detection that is being used to estimate the size of the population of binary black holes, binary black holes and other uh, major system. And so in a way, I think it's to a large extent epistemically prior to other claims about that population. Um, um, but I, I think this is not essential for the... Uh, um, claims uh, that I'm making here. Uh, so um, I think we have this kind of like basic type two environmental prediction and uh, we have, uh, which um, is what in a way LIGO tested. And then we have those kind of like follow-up predictions and I'm not quite sure what's the best way of thinking about them. Maybe they're like point, um, by point retrodictions of the basis of a detectable signal, or maybe a second order prediction, or maybe Ceteris Paribus clauses play a role uh, in those cases where we want to look at what the uh, kind of like electromagnetic follow up will look like. And so, in those contexts, we could be started to get worried about um, uh, restrictions concerning predictions. And I think an interesting discussion of that could be said. But for the kind of like main uh, purpose for which the LIGO was built, uh, the, which to me seems to be like, co to some extent concerned with what I call the type two environmental prediction, um, uh, the no-go theorems do not seem uh, to apply. Okay. Um, I would like to say a few things about the criticism of those theorems that have been made has been made in the literature. Um, uh, so, because I think not all of it is entirely uh, like not all of those points are um, 
do apply if we think about them more closely. Um, so Casey McCoy has um, an interesting paper on uh, uh, this topic. And um, one of the points the case makes is that partial epistemic access, namely to the data on this uh, space like size, makes direct reduction non-trivial and not, not different in kind from this like, strict of sense of prediction about the future. Um, and so perhaps we should say, we should not say that prediction is impossible in GR because we should widen the scope of predictions to allow predicted events to be anywhere in the space-time manifold. And so we get rid of the condition one that underlie those formal claims. And this is how cosmologists think about predictions. And um, moreover, Casey concludes that uh, these theorems assumes, um, or argue, Casey argues that these theorems assume an overtly idealized and non-physical notion of observation. And also that there are inductive assumptions which are crucial for predictions, but they're not taken into account um, uh, in this kind of a formal analysis. So the sense of prediction is highly artificial. And so the no-go theorems have kind of much less of a bite to them than you might initially think. I'm not sure if this is fully satisfactory to me because um, I don't think it's it's fair to say that the theorems require full access to the data on the slice. I think the theorems rather say that even if we had access to the data, full data, which we don't, then our ability to predict would be highly limited. And so by saying we don't have the full access to the data, we're only making our epistemic situation works worse. And moreover, saying that some successful retrodiction should be counted as prediction is pretty much exactly the opposite of the theorems, because the theorems tell you that some of the success at best you can make uh, an irretrodiction. And so a number of successful retrodictions, I think, um, doesn't undermine the interpretation of the theorem. Um, but I think that the kind of case study of um, and the distinction between two types of predictions um, that I have discussed in the LIGO case can actually show us some of a sense in which those theorems are genuinely limited um, uh, in kind of thinking about actual tests uh, of GR, namely by not taking into account the possibility of those type two envir environmental kinds of predictions. And I just, I just want to conclude with, I think, three uh, quick remarks. So you may say, okay, like all of this discussion, is this specific to GR? And you can or should note that matrix theorems do not assume the Einstein's field equations, but seem to be working equally well for a dynamical theory of space and with a Lorentzian manifold. Um, but um, you may also think that, well, also a kind of like my analysis of how LIGO works, at least if we had like good enough non-GR based templates, which is an ongoing work in progress, but um, numerical relativists seem to be making an amazing progress on that front. Um, so my analysis would carry over kind of equally well to modified gravity theories. And so none of this is tied really to particulars of GR, but rather, uh, uh, you know, we could consider some FR or whatever other dynamical theory of space-time. And I think the discussion would look quite similar. Um, I should say something more about induction and ceteris paribus clauses and all of that. So in one of the LIGO papers, uh, they describe, uh, when they describe kind of like sensitivity of what you would get with this LISA setup. So we call this is a setup where we have like very large, like when we have like um, an, uh, a gravitational wave detector uh, orbiting around in space. So, and if that can be pulled off, then the sensitivity of the LISA would be really amazing because um, uh, I haven't said that, but I should have that, you know, like most of the most of the detections that the LIGO made uh, are fairly short. It's like, you know, order of few seconds. Uh, typically, I think the longest one is something like 45 or 50 seconds, but many of them are much shorter. Uh, but with ELISA, you could detect the kind of like early in spiral phase of the merger by something like up to a thousand years before the merger event itself. So you could say, oh, I have detected with LISA a very early part of a signal. And I, if I can go, do like good enough matching of 
that uh, to the templates, then maybe I can say what the signal at the merger itself will look like in a thousand years uh, from now. And so now I think there's a sense in which if once we're making these kinds of predictions uh, from kind of like early part of a signal to very late parts of a signal, then indeed we do need to assume something like a ceteris paribus clause, because we need to assume that you know, by the time the late part of the signal arrives to us and gravitational waves seem to be traveling at um, uh, the speed of light. Um, so this late part of the signal will be kind of like, will not be influenced by uncontrolled sources of modulation. And I think in this context, some of the concerns that um, Casey McCoy raises do actually become crucial because then we need to think about what the Ceteris Parables uh, clauses are and in the kind of like, formal framework for deference, it means that we won't get like weird kind of holes uh, showing up in space time, or that it's not unusually folded um, outside our observational past. Um, so actually, let me uh, say one, let me, let me make one more statement about this. And this is my last but one slide. Uh, so I hope you'll still uh, bear with me. Um, so um, the proofs of Manchak's theorem, Manchak's theorems assume with, that the way they work is that we make an assumption that some point P about which the prediction is being made is in the domain of genuine prediction and not on the boundary of the causal past of some point Q. And then we construct a space time from which that point is somehow missing, so to speak. And um, um, because of the way in which one generates these sorts of examples, um, one could, and I, I think it, uh, quite a little bit of the literature, qu quite a bit of literature is kind of going in the uh, in this direction. Is so you may say, oh, like I don't like this construction because the construction has somehow missing physical significance. And there are like standard interpretational moves where one, some people will say, yeah, it's an artificial space time, and some other people will say, but you can create any space time by cutting and pasting space time regions. Um, um, mm, and other people will say, oh, like, let's list what's a physically reasonable space time and make sure that the one that I constructed in the proof is kind of like nice enough. Like you can do all of those things. But mm, um, and I, I've done them, they're, they're fun. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fun discussion to be had, but maybe a more productive view would be this. Um, so these kinds of objections only work against a particular construction of observation in distinguishable spacetime. And I think many of the black hole spacetime examples, or at least the kind of like Hans Ringstrom examples of underdetermination of some cosmological properties do not rely on this particular construction. Um, and so maybe a good question to ask is also, are there some kinds of like robust dynamical mechanisms for producing those or similar holes? And so, uh, the kind of situation I'm thinking of here is, you know, here I detected early in spiral, I'm making a, a signal from early in spiral phase. I'm saying, I'm making a claim about what the signal here at the merger would look like. And so that signal will have to kind of like travel to me from like very far away in the universe. But if there is a kind of hole that happens on the way there, um, the future of the hole, uh, of course, it's not kind of determined by the state of uh, the merging system. And so the gravitational wave system signal passing through the future of the whole could be modulated in some way, uh, but whatever comes out of that naked singularity or whatever it is. Um, and so then we should think carefully about dynamical mechanisms that might produce uh, uh, these or similar holes. And if not, if there are kind of like no dynamically viable mechanism for producing these holes, then maybe we can be a bit less concerned about uh, some of those examples because uh, um, indeed they would have physical significance, but uh, in a kind of, not in the sense that they violate this or that particular condition, but because we don't know generating mechanisms uh, for some of them. And so then one could say that it's kind of like uh, those situations are dynamically implausible or they may be kinematically plausible or something like that. And indeed, there are some mechanisms which could maybe then do not lead to produ production of holes in a straightforward sense, 
the notion of whole is not a straightforward one then anyway. But there are some explicit mechanisms which could lead to loss of causal properties in GR. So if gravitational collapse with naked singularity would happen generically, that's one. Black hole evaporation, that's another. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do know about loss of very specific causal properties um, in uh, the case of plane gravitational waves, for instance. And so, uh, mm, occurrence of such mechanisms could be uh, one of the ways in which those uh, ceteris paribus uh, clauses uh, for the case of ELISA uh, could perhaps uh, uh, be stated. Okay, well, at, at least I think this is kind of like a good, maybe it's not an alternative to thinking about like whether a space time is physically reasonable or not, but it's kind of like at least a good complement. And I think we should pay a bit more attention to this kind of like a dynamical complement com complement of this kind of like more kinematical, uh, so to speak, uh, constraint. All right, I just want to conclude this very briefly. So I took you through some of the reasons why you may be worried about uh, impossibility or limitations of predictions in GR. I took you through the example of the uh, uh, LIGO detection of gravitational waves. And I tried to disarm um, uh, some of the worries that we might have about the LIGO prediction. And I think that if I'm kind of on the right track, I think that one could conclude this in the following way. So Manchak said there seems to be said that there seems to be an interesting and robust sense in which genuine prediction is not possible in general relativity. But there also seem, if my analysis of like two types of predictions is on the right track, there seem to be other interesting and robust ways in which GR is used uh, in making uh, predictions that we could and should have a look at. And uh, yeah, this is all I had for today. I just List, I'm just going to list some references so we have them on the recording for later. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your comments and discussion. Let's start uh, with Richard. Um, when I teach uh, introductory philosophy of science, um, the issue of prediction comes up naturally. Uh, and one says things like, well, uh, when a theory makes predictions, if they're successful, that confirms the theory. And if they're unsuccessful, that disconfirms the theory. Um, but I also say, well, what do we mean by a prediction? Um, we might mean uh, predicting uh, in advance, predicting an event before it occurs, which we can make sense of relativistically or non-relativistically. Uh, but I also say that actually a better sense of prediction is predicting before you know, um, in which case one can predict things about the past. Um, and one can predict things which are not um, entailed by information you presently possess, um, but would be extremely unlikely in the absence of the theory that you uh, take yourself to be confirmed when what you did not know uh, turns out to be true. Um, and there are many cases like that. Um, for example, in uh, evolutionary biology, one typically says um, one can predict that there will be marsupial fossils in Antarctica based on the theories of biogeography and uh, tectonic plates. Um, and uh, one can predict the existence of a moth, um, um, I believe, in um, um, Zanzibar, maybe, but no, Madagascar, that's the name I'm talking about. Um, with a tongue uh, about 20 centimeters long, um, something that Darwin is said to have predicted. And of course, that moth was there all the time. So in a sense, this counts like as a retroviction. But as far as making Darwin's theory more plausible, it's a verified prediction. Um, so I think epistemologically, what's interesting is not the issue of whether you can predict ahead of time, uh, but whether you can predict something or in the sense of uh, giving you much stronger to re reason to believe that this is the case based on a theory than it otherwise would have been, even if what you're uh, in that sense predicting occurred uh, long ago. Um, so, so in that sense, I think the theorems about uh, impossibility of prediction and general relativity are taking a very narrow uh, 
view of what prediction is, if what you're interested in is epistemology. Right. Okay, yes, that's a great point. I, I think one could add to this that something like uh, prediction about Big Bang is another prediction that should not be thought of in any sensible sense. Of course, it's a successful prediction of a theory. Um, it's used to disconfirm some of the alternatives to it, or uh, at least some pieces of evidence that we have in favor of the Big Bang hypothesis are used to disconfirm alternatives to the theory. And of course, it can and should not be understood as a statement about the future. Um, yes. So this, I think, is entirely with the, the many of the other examples you described, the, all of the geological ones, for instance, are naturally very much in line with what Casey McCoy has to say yes. about these cases. Um, and uh, um, I personally wouldn't, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with calling these things predictions as well. And maybe one could then distinguish predictions about the past versus predictions of the future and use this yeah. famous quip that prediction is hard, especially about the future. Right. Um, and then those theorems maybe would only be concerned with prediction about the future, uh, yeah. so to speak. And so in that way, it would increase our epistemic situation or it, sorry, it would improve our epistemic situation a little bit. But still, I think it's interesting that what we do test in gravitational astronomy are statements which are about our future. And that seems to avoid somehow, at least to a large extent, avoid. Um, so those would fall under the kind of like scope of the theorems if they were operating like type one predictions, but seem to avoid it if we pay attention to the second type of prediction about which can be made about the future or about the past, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Sam. Hey, Ilyash. I, hey. I wonder, you know, I really wonder whether the LIGO example is well chosen for the okay. conceptual point that you want to make. And it has to do with the fact that, that the conceptual framework and terminology of prediction, I, I'm not sure is really apt for what LIGO is doing. Mm -hmm. in its main goal. So the idea, of course, is that they had really no idea what they're going to see, right? It's an observatory. Um, it's like turning on a special type of telescope that we never had before. And right. people have different ideas about what you might see and how commonly you might see them. Mm -hmm. But none of the papers involved in like the proposal for this experiment or anything like that say like, this is what we predict we're going to find. What, what they did do is they gave different scenarios saying like, if this is the case, then we might see this. If this is the case, we might not see this. But none of them are put forward as hypotheses about the way the world really is. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, so the reason why I'm emphasizing this is I think that like, there's a simpler example, which is more apt, which is just one of the classical tests of GR, you know, the deflection of light around the sun. Because in that case, you do have a prediction and you had something that you can like compare with another theory to, you know, the Newtonian prediction, right? Um, so uh, in this sort of example, where we really are making a statement about what we're gonna see uh, in our causal in our causal future, a specific statement, right, about what we're going to see in the causal in our causal future, that it doesn't depend on making um, these extra hypotheses that don't have independent empirical support about how many black holes there are and how often they get together and hug, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in those cases, it seems to me to be the case that the way that we make predictions is just by making strong assumptions. Uh, stronger assumptions than the prediction theorems uh, permit or that they, that they, they count as. But I think this is related to Casey's point about induction, although I wouldn't necessarily put it in the way that he does that in order to make predictions, we have to make all sorts of auxiliary assumptions. But 
that's a point we kind of already knew from like general philosophy of science. Like take the example of um, like with the first things that we learn in physics, like um, we're gonna drop a ball from a height and we wanna predict when it's gonna hit the bottom. Now, strictly speaking, some space invader could come whizzing in into our Newtonian universe, starting from infinite speed and whack the ball out so that it goes on some other trajectory. Prediction of when the ball is gonna hit is impossible, man, it's impossible. Well, it is possible if you make stronger assumptions, right? And I take it that that's a part of the, that's a part of the idea. That we have to make stronger auxiliary assumptions in order to make uh, predictions. And if that's the case, this seems like it fits into that general understanding of how we make predictions and how we test theories. Um, anyway, so those are two ideas I want to put forward to get your reaction. Okay, I have mm, I have a number of reactions to that. Uh, so uh, this is great. So the first is um, I I don't think I find myself disagreeing with Casey, and I hope I didn't give that impression. I think some of the points that Casey makes are very apt. Like, and I think the Liza example shows that quite well because we do need to have some kind of like strong assumptions about what kind of weird stuff happens elsewhere while the signal travels to us um, that could perhaps even be like you know stated geometrically uh, or, or you know in GR terms uh, so to speak like no weird modulation in our causal elsewhere while the signal travels sorts of examples. And I think those can and should be interpreted as kind of like some form of strong inductive assumptions. Um, so this is one thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is, I agree that the example of LIGO I picked is not a unique one. I'm, I'm not sure if it's the best one, but it's just the one that I started thinking of at some point. And I think it's good to look at that example as well. So I'm not saying that this is the unique example that allows us to somehow disarm or dissolve some of those theorems. I think some of the other examples that you mentioned, like the deflection of light is sure uh, um, a good example as well. That still leaves us with a possibility, like kind of with, like with, with kind of deciding whether the LIGO example I used is a good one uh, or not. And if, the argument that it's not really a good or not a relevant one uh, um, would work along the lines of um, what I took you as saying, with namely, oh, this is an observatory and they didn't really knew what's going to show up, um, then, um, I, then I think I would like to actually push against this line. And I would like to push it in two ways. The first is, uh, that uh, there is um, so th there's a sense in which they didn't know what exactly is going to show up because they we, before LIGO of course we didn't really knew like what kinds of masses are there and so it could be the case that you know we built the LIGO but in our universe uh, there are no uh, sources that generate signals in the upper pit frequency and so by the kind of like poor choice of the operational frequency or unlucky choice of the operational frequency uh, we would not see any kind of uh, signal although it's there and maybe that would even disconfirm the theory in some way. Um, um, but I, I, I think that like it's not just an observatory that like we turn on and see what happens. It's an observatory that uh, requires an enormous amount of the theory input in particular in the matched filtering uh, searches. So there's a lot of, uh, it's not like we just build it and turn it on and see what happens. Uh, there's, uh, there's this moment as a matter of fact where um, um, in the history of the construction of the LIGO detectors where people are worried that 
okay, like we, you know, we have uh, built, like the structures are going well. We have good enough control over vacuum for the lasers that are bouncing off and good enough control over the mirrors. But there's this moment where kind of like a theory input about models of those sources is not forthcoming. And there's a real worry that kind of like numerical relativity people are not up to speed and the kind of component of the operation of all of this, um, um, which is necessary for the match filtering method, which is expected to be able to give access to multiple sources is uh, not forthcoming. And so this is not a concern that you have if you're uh, kind of like just building observatory and turning it on and uh, seeing what happens. And so in that sense, there is uh, like a massive kind of like theory input and theory motivation that goes in to the design of an experiment. And as for um, whether it's a prediction or not, sorry, as, as for to the extent to which it kind of actually drives the construction of experiment. So Kip Thorne has this uh, kind of like more popular book from I think 95 and um, what's the title? Um, Oh, I'm blanking off on the title. Um, Black holes and time warps. Oh yes, exa thank you. Exactly, black holes and time warps. And so, if you if you look at the kind of like gravitational wave section of that book, there's a moment where Kip Thorne tells the story about at the time, of course, LIGO is a project under construction, and he tells a story that basically about what the future uh, detections of those signals will look like. That apart from some numbers concerning frequencies of observations and about when the observatory will be um, operational is not that far off from the situation we find ourselves in uh, something like 25 years later. And so that's a point where we say, well, is it is the prediction? Well, Thorn tells a story about what these observations will look like, and that story turns out to be quite close to what is happening. And so in that sense, I, I think those are kind of like the ways in which I would like to push against this. Uh, I agree with you that LIGO is not a unique example, but I think it's a good example for thinking about prediction. Antonio, can I step in to respond? Yes, of course. Okay. I would love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I, I, I mean, should have also said, like, this is, I think, the second time or third time I'm giving this talk. So, uh, <laughs> sure, sure, no of worries, course, it, you know, guys, how it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. Work I in mean, progress and all of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I take your points. On the other hand, uh, I think maybe you have in mind too narrow of a definition of what an observatory is than, than I did, uh, especially compared with what I did. So, every instrument has theory behind it. Right, so it's not a matter of right. whether it does or it doesn't. It's just a matter of the degree, and the degree is more correlated with the sophistication of the instrument than it has to do with whether it's an observatory or not. Right. Um, so, so, so I, I don't think that that's you know really the relevant distinction. Um, I think the relevant distinction is we're going to get into some you know some muddy waters related to the stuff that Richard was talking about about like. In order for it to count as a prediction, like how much did you have to know about what was going to happen before you use the theory, right? So another right. classic example, of course, in GR is the precession of the perihelion of Mercury that's mm -hmm. been much discussed in this literature. And I didn't use that example initially because it presents a number of complications. Yeah. One of the complications is well, you have some conditional information that's going in. You're assuming some things, and then based on those other things, you're making a prediction. On the other hand, you've already observed, you've already measured the procession, so you kind of, but, but the procession didn't go into the theory, wasn't a part of the way you constructed it. You, you know how this literature I know, sure. We could, yeah, we yeah, could, yeah, yeah. We could yeah, kind yeah. of maybe say, well, we want to do something like the precession, but for other, source sure that sure we haven't sure. measured yet and then but the second thing yeah. i think is the most relevant one actually and it has to do with the fact that the procession it represents an observable that's not definable at a point of space time mm -hmm. 
it's an observable which is only definable over a region. Sure. And it involves some sort of averaging over in a, both a temporally and a spatially extended region. One of the things that is not treated in the, the mathematical literature on prediction in GR is how to understand these sorts of extended observables. Everything, it, it is, it is, apparently everyone just assumes that everything that you can predict will show up at a point, but I don't, I don't really know. Yeah. I don't really know if that's right. I mean, maybe there's an argument ultimately that somehow the information about what happens on, say, compact regions gets embedded into a point somehow. But uh, the, the, the issue here, of course, is that um, both the LIGO detections and the precession examples involve quantities that are best represented on extended regions of space time. Um, and one of the reasons why that make, gives a complication involves whether or not that region is allowed to extend into your past or into your future. Right. You, you can see where this is going. So in the case of the precession of the perihelion, um, we've got a big region, four-dimensional region in the past that on which we're conditioning in order to give predictions yep. in the future. In, uh, in the LIGO case, we don't have stuff in the past we're conditioning on. We have theoretical hypotheses about the distribution of black holes and various properties, plus assumptions about the apparatus itself that we're conditioning on. And these don't give predictions about what's going to happen at specific space-time events, but only give a frequency distribution over an extended time for what you're going to find. It's even less okay. than that. They don't even really give you like, at, at, at least I've, I think quite, one could make this point of slightly stronger. We don't yeah. really know what the frequency of observations will be like before we- Without making really strong assumptions, right? Yeah. So this is what I'm saying. But if you, so if you don't make those assumptions, so this is why there's this a little bit of an ambiguity maybe about whether you can use, you know, observatories as yeah. things that you predict, because if you make strong enough assumptions, you can use observatories to predict. But if you decline from making stronger assumptions, you're just, as it were, collecting data of a certain sort. And if you find some patterns, then you can make some inferences about what you saw without saying ahead of time about what you expect yourself to be seeing. Um, anyway, I think that these, these sorts of features make the distinction between like, when do we use something to predict versus when we don't depend on how strong the assumptions we're going to want to make. Makes me think that like, maybe like these classic examples are gonna be easier to treat and you won't you won't upset uh, uh, cranky people like me. <laughs> uh, um, mm -hmm. But um, but I think that you know th these are all, these are all features that are worth considering. For this. Great, this is this is very fun. Uh, so I have I think three things to say. The first is um, oh th there's a point about points and endpoints, but I, I'll leave that for later. But just so like we don't forget to go back to this. Um, um, I guess, I, I think I would like to stress that, like, you know, there is, um, it's not like we just turn the observatory on and see what happens because we do have like very um, strong theory-based assumptions that we do, that we will actually see gravitational waves with LIGO or, you know, in, in some kind of frequency range sooner or later, because so this observatory is built for the particular purpose. And at the moment where people decide, okay, like we have some, maybe not very principled, but more like 
maybe not you know following directly from GR, but from some other assumptions about sources that generate certain kinds of signals. We do have some estimate about the frequency, and we know that you know it's reasonable on whatever astrophysical grounds to expect mergers of uh, that will give us the appropriate frequency. And there's a moment in the history where we're like, okay. Like previous gravitational wave experiments do not really work, but we kind of have some control over the right frequency range. And so we want to build an observatory that will be able to test whether in that frequency range we will see something. That to me uh, is like the way I just told the story. Like to me, this is, an, um, and I guess this is where cranky people like you will disagree. And I think this is in a way. Like it, it seems to me that we're agreeing on most of the particulars of what we're saying, but you somehow don't really want to call the decision of people who decide to say, who, who decide to build this observatory to say that it's predicated upon a prediction, so to speak. Does that sound right? Uh, I do, and another is that. It also depends on whether you're thinking about predictions, how specific the prediction is supposed to be, mm -hmm. right? So right. if the prediction is supposed to be kind of like, uh, at this space time point, we're going to register this event or something like that. Of course, that's yeah. not like the in the thing. case of the perihelion, for instance, or light deflection. The light deflection is going to be the example that fits best the simple yeah. case where you have point events. Uh, yeah. And those are the things that you're measuring and predicting. Yeah. Um, but in these other cases, we have uh, things that are extended over time. So I would be more willing to grant that LIGO is an instrument that is used to verify certain types of or check certain types of predictions if we allow the thing to be predicted to be much broader uh, and less specific than in the light deflection case. Right. But I, it requires, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it requires expanding the notion of what's being observed to something which is extended over a space time region, which needs to somehow be addressed in this framework. Uh, and because you were using this framework, that kind of like assumes that all of the things that we're going to be measuring are going to be at points because the definition of predictability, right, is about point events. I, I had assumed that you're taking on board that assumption about predictability. Okay, well, so. But if you don't want to do that, I... more power to you because I would agree with that, that you shouldn't, <laughs> but I, I didn't want to fight that necessarily. Um, yeah, I don't think I should, and I'm also not. I I I I think the kind of upshot of this talk is actually um, it's it's more along the lines of, well, there's this formal way of thinking about prediction, but it just doesn't seem to fit very well with some of the pragmatics of uh, using GR in testing predictions, per my type two prediction or environmental or whatever. I still haven't converged on the name for that. Uh, um, and so in a way. I take the upshot of what I'm doing to be, in this particular instance, rather critical about the framework, uh, rather than pro the framework. So that's one thing I'd like to say. The second thing I'd like to say is, uh, um, I I agree with you that it's a very weird kind of a prediction that LIGO tests, and I think it's interesting and important to acknowledge that, that this is not a prediction about you know, when a particular signal will hit us or even how often it will hit us. I think it's a, in a way, it's quite astonishing that people have spent 40 years on such a kind of non-specific prediction. Uh, for, for, sorry, 40 years of building a detector and a lot of money on making operational on such a non-specific prediction based on some plausibility arguments about signals being available, being present in this uh, frequency range. Um, and that's, I, 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 but of course, that's of course grist for my meal because I think it's actually another way by looking at the way that the, the kind of like different kinds of predictions tested by uh, 
LIGO um, or of some philosophical interest. And just super briefly, I, I would like to say one more thing on the, like whether those things are extended point, point wise. And I'm just going to report on what I think is, might be called uh, Irvine People Party Line. Uh, I'm not saying I subscribe to this view, but um, so um, the kind of background for this is that uh, for those of you who uh, maybe do not have uh, those all this stuff about undetermination fresh in the working memory, is that um, um, one of the ways so, so many of those formal results assume that we make observations at kind of like a point um, and that we're not working with, for instance, um, you know, future in extendable time like curves representing the observers, although some people in the 70s do. Um, um, and so I, I think that's an assumption that could be questioned and some questioned it. They saying, well, actually in many of those cases, like we do have some kind of like an extended process that happens in space time. Um, and so it's not clear that prediction can be made on a point by point basis. And I think the party line, and I'm not saying I subscribe to the party line is that, well, if you have a process that you're measuring, um, then there will be a point at which you kind of finished measuring this process. And we could just as well take that point, to, that end point of a, whatever you know, curve represents the process and make statements about that moment, kind of like once you finished making the measurement of that process. In that way, I guess one could try, I'm not saying I want to do because I think here I'm rather critical of the framework in a way, at least pointing out to the framework, the fact that framework cannot, does not, maybe not cannot, but does not accommodate some of the pragmatics of application of GR, so to speak. But in that way, one could kind of try to get around the objection that the framework is um, so uniquely tied to like observations made at particular space-time points, because kind of like finite processes could just as well be thought of as endpoint of those processes, so to speak. I'm not sure if that party line would be convincing, but I guess it's one possible reply to that. Having said that, I want to say that as a matter of fact, um, one could have an interesting conversation about um, kind of, uh, and that's another way in which some of those frameworks are somewhat deficient because they do not allow us to make statements about moderately sized uh, space-time properties uh, and makes a lot of observations about local space-time properties and global space-time properties. But there could be mid-sized local space-time properties, for instance, quasi-local properties. And um, there is no formal way to capture that in the framework as it is, but uh, ongoing piece of work with some other people uh, may give us some hints about how to clearly think about quasi-local space-time properties, which I think would also somewhat go into the way of addressing some of your concerns about why all of this is so uniquely tied to space-time points. Okay, so next in line, we have uh, Johan. Hey. Um, you mentioned, um, the suggestion by McCoy that um, um, the problem with these theorems is that um, Mantrak um, puts uh, too, uh, too restrictive requirements on our notion of prediction. And he, his particular example was that, um, uh, was that, um, uh, he uh, um, he requires that we know exactly the initial data, right? And you, you criticize that, that this is not really a fair objection. Um, and um, I'm thinking about a similar, uh, a bit similar objection. And my question is whether it makes sense to you. Uh, uh, so uh, the objection is that, um, um, him, Mantrak makes another requirement that at least in some contexts uh, is too restrictive, namely that uh, 
we need to be able to detect the initial data, which is why uh, we are allowed uh, to make predictions on the basis only on this data that are within our past light cone. Uh, so, um, um, on the basis of what was already said about induction and such as causes and so on, um, one could, um, I would like to suggest that uh, we could um, relax uh, this particular assumption. So, uh, at least in some contexts, we can make sense of making predictions that are based on initial data, which lie on a surface that are not uh, entirely within uh, our past light cone. So we just, uh, let's say, detected part of them and uh, like further in the past, we have investigated uh, this system and we can um, uh, kind of extrapolate that and uh, uh, in this way, uh, we can, um, we will be not sure about this data, but we could assume that there is some initial data on the surface that only partially lies within our past like cone and partially is outside of it. Uh, and uh, then we can make some predictions uh, about uh, the future. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think something like that, for instance, happens in the Liza example. So then you say like, okay, I'm thinking of, so, so I, I have, you know, some things I know about the system. I'm an observer placed here. And then you can kind of say like further idealize the situation and say like, okay, maybe I'm observer at uh, infinity in some way. And um, although I only have a partial access um, to the system, I can assume that there's kind of like no other relevant kind of like confounding factors. So I could calculate this whole thing as if I were an observer at infinity and as if the system was like, you know, like asymptotically flat in the sense that no other sources are present. Um, and uh, if that is indeed the case, then I should see a particular system. And that's one of the ways in which Ceteris Paribus clause uh, for this system would operate. So in other words, what we would do is we would um, have some partial access to the initial state of a system. And then we assume that everything else can be neglected. And depending on the particular kind of physical setup that we're interested in, um, we would pick like different asymptotic boundary conditions. And so do appropriate gluing of the initial data sets uh, to the part that we know about the system. Um, so, you know, if you assume that there are no other gravitational sources, then you pick asymptotic flatness. If you think that all of this happens like uh, close to the horizon of an extremal black hole, then maybe you pick ADS boundary conditions. And uh, if um, there's something cosmologically relevant, then you pick asymptotically this or that cosmological model. Um, and so, yeah, I think that points like all of these kinds of procedures basically point out to some of the ways in which uh, kind of like Ceteris Paribus uh, conditions operate. And I think that's the good part of what Casey, uh, but also before him, uh, Norton, in his work on induction in the context of observation in distinguishable space times, point out to. Yeah. And then, of course, you could ask, well, but do I have justification for assuming that boundary condition? And uh, then one could have a discussion about, which would be um, actually quite analogous to the discussion that people have about undetermination of those cosmological global properties. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Uh, I, I, yes. I, I want to add one point, namely that you contrasted in your talk, at least, like two kinds of predictions. One was about a particular system and uh, the other kind was about I don't know, types of systems or something like that. Environment, I think. Yeah, yeah. and but what I'm saying uh, it could be uh, about a particular system. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's about particular system. Uh, so that's a kind of like, if you wish, a way of saying that, okay, like maybe some 
weird stuff happens outside of uh, the, this region of space and that I have directly observed, but I'm making something like inductive or assumption or ceteribus paribus clause in the form of asymptotic flatness or whatever other boundary condition like that. And in that way, I can restore some predictability about um, in the cases where in GR I'm dealing with the first type of systems. And I think that's the right thing to say. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, um, and so I, and I think something like that needs to be used for some pieces of some aspects of gravitational wave predictions, like in the Liza case, when I said that there are no like modulation sources and all those like weird like all, all those mechanisms for the loss of causal properties won't happen on the way and like weirdly influence the signal. I think this is exactly the sort of assumptions that you would need to have. But you, I don't think you need that for the kind of like. Um, major like first part of uh, what LIGO predicts, namely not what the observator was built for, that we will detect certain kinds of signals and so on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Julius, you mentioned the fact that you have some ongoing work that may have some repercussions for the issue of stake. Do you want to share some hints of this? Um, so like for the black hole case? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about some of this. Um, so um, it's, it's very much work in progress, but um, and there are, what, one starting point is that you could make this claim that has been made in cosmological context that there are some things we cannot know about global structure of the space that we're living in. And um, if you think about this, of course, you may ask yourself, well, when we model black hole space times, we're also making use of a number of global space time properties, sometimes very similar ones like causal properties and sometimes very different ones. Uh, like asymptotic flatness is of course not a condition that you should be interested in in a cosmological situation. And so you could ask a set of questions, the first of which would be something like, can similar statements about those global properties that are relevant for the black hole, for modeling black hole space times, like do similar underdetermination claims hold about them? That's the first type of questions. And the second type of questions is, uh, even if those statements hold, does some form of skepticism about, for instance, existence of black holes um, follows? And the third kind of questions you may ask yourself is, okay, is um, a particular way of thinking about uh, um, observers and observations and what they have access to, is that the most fortunate choice for thinking about uh, modern black holes? Um, and so uh, I've, I've, the, the last one, I think, takes us to the, some of the things that Sam was worried about, that oh, we're only making observations at a point, but uh, maybe this is not the most, the best choice. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the literature, like at uh, David Malaman's work on this, he actually considered a number of different notions of observational and distinguishability over and above those that are kind of like prominently looked at in those more recent discussions. So you can ask whether two space times are observationally the same um, um, for observers who live at particular from the point of view of a particular point in space time or from the point of view of a future inextendable time like curve, and whether you can find um, like um, whether these two space times are observationally indistinguishable in a symmetric way or asymmetric way. And it's kind of like the most recent literature is only concerned with what happens at, for any particular point in an asymmetric way. Um, at least like there's kind of like Manchak type examples of cosmological determination or, or in this category. Um, and so uh, this is the sort of like backup for this. And now you could say some things that we think could be said is, 
these notions of observational distinguishability are not exhaustive. We tried some of the other ones. Some, so we tried a number of other ones. Some seem to reduce to those four types, but we found at least one that does not seem to reduce uh, to those, which is, I think, and it, 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 it's, uh, it's interesting that you can actually do find something that's, uh, mm, mm, that's not exhausted by those notions. Um, and it can remedy also some, depending on the situation you're in, it can remedy some certain kinds of underdetermination. The second claim you can make is a, a number of properties such as the, whether the space time has an event horizon or not do fall prey to the underdetermination. But the third point is you should not make a skeptical point on that basis because many of those properties play role of certain idealizations. And so if some, but not all of the examples that you can construct kind of lack physical significance because you're too literal, so to speak, about those global properties. But then of course you can also, what you can do is you can ask um, whether some particular physically significant solutions such as regular black holes do provide with a form of undetermination which would be analogous to the cosmological one. And then the answer seems to be yes. That's more or less, uh, that's more or less uh, what we're looking at. Um, uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs>